then we'll have our baptism service. And following the baptism, then we'll have a communion. And you know, if, um, if we have time today, we, we, we might even, I, I might even get to say a few words. But I'm sure glad that you're today, here, you're here, and ask that uh, God would bless you for your being here and uh, that you'd get the time to fellowship with one another too. Uh, so let's, um, thank you, Tim. Appreciate it very much.
Thank you very much. That was a combined choir, actually. And uh, they did a great job. It was fantastic. Uh, this, this is a... Uh, I, I get really pumped. I get really charged when we get to do uh, baptisms because it's such a significant part of a person's journey as they uh, walk with God and follow Jesus. It's just a very, very important part. Um, there's one of the things, though, that we need to do as a church before we start the baptism, in this, and that is this. I need to explain to you that I don't baptize because I'm an ordained minister. That doesn't give me the authority to baptize. I baptize because you as a church have given me authority to be able to baptize, and I baptize representing Grace Church. Well, we have a young man named Lucas who's going to be baptized today, and Lucas would like his father to baptize him. And that's okay to do, but we need to give Mike then the authority from Grace Church to be able to baptize his son. So the way we do that is simply to say, all those in favor of giving Mike the authority to baptize his son Lucas, just say, Amen. Amen. And if you're opposed to that, by the same sign. So that's unanimous. So uh, for today, uh, then we're, we're, we're giving authority to Mike to baptize his son Lucas. And the other thing that uh, we like to do here is before each one of the candidates then are baptized, we just have a very brief video of their testimony because their testimony of their salvation in Jesus Christ is so vital to the fact that they're being uh, baptized. It's their identification with what saves them, their identification with Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and um, letting you know now that they're identified with him. So uh, I'll ask uh, our, our first candidates for baptism are Monica and Raymond Chu. And uh, Monica, if you'll come, please. My name is Monica, and I am from Malaysia. I was raised in a Christian family. Um, I knew about God and about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, but my foundation in God's word was not strong. So I became consumed with worldly things and was living uh, for the acceptance of others. About three years ago, a friend invited me to go for Bible study with her. So I took the opportunity to um, study God's Word. Initially, um, studying the Word was difficult because I didn't put my whole heart into it. But uh, thankfully, I continued to, to read His Word and uh, God has been gracious. He has been revealing His Word, His truth to me. Um, in John fourteen six, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this verse has convicted me that Jesus is the only way in my life. I have um, made a decision to renew my faith in Jesus. I have confessed my sins to God. I have uh, accepted Jesus as Savior, as my Savior from sin and as Lord of my life. I know God has directed me to this church. I want to be baptized because I want to profess my faith publicly and I want to be identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. My name is Raymond and I'm from Singapore. I don't have a Christian background and I always wonder what it is after life. I've continued to experience emptiness within myself and I'm not sh sure why I felt that way. Recently, my wife and I were invited by a friend to attend Saturday service at Grace Church. The sermons given by the pastor got my attention and had me thinking about life and God. I'm motivated from my heart to learn more about God and I've also started to read the Bible. I believe God drew me to Him. God's messages to men shared by the pastor 
made me realize that I'm a sinner and needed Jesus in my life to set me free from my sins and emptiness that I have been experiencing. I've asked God to forgive all my sins through Jesus and I put my trust in Him alone. I've received Jesus as my Savior and I've since found hope for life. I want to be baptized to express my faith openly and to identify myself as a follower of Jesus Christ. I believe with my new faith can change me and I'm committed to living for God instead of others. When I was five years old, I asked my mom to pray and help me understand how Jesus is my Savior. I understood that Jesus died on the cross to wash away my sins. So I asked Jesus to dwell in me. The reason I want to be baptized is because it says in the Bible to follow Jesus' example. And I want to be obedient to his word and get baptized. I am ready to show the world that I am walking with with God and I will stay faithful to Him. When I was four years old, my older brother wanted to become a Christian. I didn't want to be left behind with, my, with all my other brothers being cr Christian. So I asked my mom if I could become a Christian. A few years later, a few years later, I finally understood what it meant for Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and for him to reign in my life and be my savior. So I became a, so I became a Christian then. I want to be baptized so others will know that I'm a Christian and I follow in the steps of Christ and that I will live with him forever. I prayed to Jesus and I asked him into my heart and I believed that he died on the cross and that he was from the grave and that he forgave my sins. Because I, my old self has died and I'm a new person and I want other people to, to know that I'm, I am a Christian.
And all God's people said? Amen. Yes, that's great. So I'm going to, I'd like to give them uh, just a couple minutes to be able to get ready because um, I'd like for us to join together in the First Communion with our newly baptized uh, church members and uh, ask them to participate in that. Uh, however, I know the Sunday school teachers are wanting to uh, have a few minutes with you kids. So, kids, you may be dismissed unless your parents want you to stay for communion. Otherwise, kids, you can go ahead and go to Sunday school and, uh, uh, yes. Uh, middle school, if you'll stay for the communion, please. Middle school, if you'll stay for communion. High school, high school, you need to stay here too. Yeah. I, I want to take a few minutes to just uh, make some comments about the resurrection while people are getting ready, getting changed, and coming back. I'm going to, uh, I guess it's okay to do the communion in my bare feet. Um, I don't know if Jesus did or didn't, but I know he took his shoes off when he went inside, and they had the Last Supper inside, so probably they were barefoot. But uh, anyway, he wasn't wearing gym pants, I'm sure. So, uh, but... Uh, the, this resurrection, and, and we do this every year. We have Easter every year. Easter comes and goes. And oftentimes, you know, this is the one Sunday where people really feel like they, they need to be in church. Uh, the thing is about here at Grace Church, we do Easter every Sunday. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you know somebody who happened to miss it this Sunday, you can bring them next Sunday. We're going we're gonna to have a celebration all over again just because... We serve a risen living Savior, and it's amazing that it's, he's, he's alive. But it's also interesting to note that uh, everybody knows that once a person dies, they're dead, right? Dead. And I can promise you that nobody here has ever seen someone who's come back from the dead. But yet, here we are, one day of the year... Many people are here today to celebrate the fact that a dead man lives. One day of the year, there's many people gathering in churches that are realizing that and celebrating the fact a dead man, a man died, was put in the grave, and he's alive today. So how does that work? Uh, what, what does that do for, for uh, our livelihood? Well, the thing is, if you were to go and tell your colleagues tomorrow or the next day, hey, let me tell you about somebody who was dead and now he's alive. And they would look at you like, you're kidding. Because nobody believes that. And yet, our faith is founded on a fundamental truth that we absolutely adhere to and cannot let go, that a man died on a cross, was put in a grave, laid in that grave for three days, and we're celebrating his resurrection today uh, from 2,000 some years ago. There are some people who say this Jesus guy, he's a myth. He's not really real. That it's just a, it's just a story that some guys made up. I, I seriously, I, I take that into serious doubt simply because this is a story that's way too weird to actually to, to have been made up as a, as a myth of some sort. Um, but I'd like for us to just... For, let's, let's read together this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, beginning with verses 1 through 11. Oh, did I not put it on there? 
Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Who's got their Bible with them? My iPad is in my office. Can I have your Bible? Ah, uh, Karen, come on up. You can read it for me because I don't have my glasses either. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, brothers, I want to remind you that the gospel I preached to you, which, which, you reached, or, sorry, which you received and on which you have taken your stand, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I have received, I passed on to you as, first of, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the, at the same time, most of them still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to one, to me also, as one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was not without effect. No. Nope. I worked harder than all of them, yet, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. Thank you. This is what he preached, and this is what we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, <clears throat> next, next slide. The reason I ask these questions is because there's been a change in evangelical Christian thinking. One of the fundamentals of our faith is, and the foundation of our faith, is believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if I were to ask you the question, do you believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead? How many of you would raise your hand and say, yes, I believe that? Okay. Um, I, I would say to you, frankly, that that's a fundamental of our faith. And if a person does not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it would be hard to claim, then, that they're a Christian by biblical standards. But here's the thing, is that there's this uh, dualistic attitude or philosophy that has kind of crept in to where uh, some people say, well, we have a spiritual body and we have a physical body. And they'll believe that there is a spiritual resurrection, but not a physical resurrection. So if I were to ask you today... Do you believe that Jesus Christ lives 100% in a human body and is 100% divine? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that actually because one of the astounding figures is amongst Christians and particularly evangelicals is that figure, <clears throat> excuse me, is going down. The reason it's going down is because there's, there's, it's, it's difficult to believe that someone could actually physical raise it from the grave. And... Uh, that was why Paul is dealing with this with the church in Corinth. There were some questions about whether or not there was a resurrection, and this resurrection then, uh, how did it take place? And part of it was due to the influence around them of Greek philosophy and Greek thinking, the dualistic anthropology and so forth, uh, with the fact that there's a spiritual and there's a physical. So, yes, there was a spiritual resurrection, but there wasn't a physical one. Now then, when we come to this, uh, to... Our beliefs today, we believe that Jesus rose again from the grave uh, physically. Uh, next next side, slide, please. <clears throat> These were the influences that Paul was dealing with. Strong pagan influences, also the non-spiritual philosophy and a worldview, and also something that we deal with quite often is the, it's, it's irrational and senseless thinking to say that somebody rose up from the grave. Would you agree with that? I mean, come on. You, you go to work tomorrow, and you, a, and you ask around to somebody who's not a believer, not a Christian, whether or not they believe that someone rose again from the dead, you, 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 and, and ask. And, and for the most part, I would say most people would say, nah, that's crazy. That's crazy. And, and I have to, in honesty, I think we all need to deal with the fact that, really? 
we're putting our faith in the, in the truth that a man died on a cross and was put into the grave and rose up again. Now, uh, Paul deals with this, and he gives us four uh, historical truths that are for the resurrection. These historical truths are, number one, Jesus died. It's a fact Jesus died on the cross. It's, it's not uh, a question. Again, there's some who would say that Jesus is a myth, but you do a Google search of um, atheists who believe in Jesus. And it's very interesting indeed how many atheists would say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Of course he's a real person. There's no question. Yet atheists will even say there's no question that Jesus is a real person. They don't believe that he's God. Okay, I... I can also understand that because there's a, there's a step of faith that goes into that. And it's not an unreasonable faith. However, we know that Jesus died. We know that Jesus was buried. The fact that he was buried is also evidence of his death. We don't usually want to bury somebody who's living. The fact that he was in the grave for three days is evidence of his death. But we also know that Jesus rose again. And how do we know that Jesus rose again? Well. Peter, or Paul gives us some instances. First of all, uh, Paul says, Jesus appeared to Peter. Interesting that Jesus appeared to Peter. You remember last week we talked about that Peter was one of the ones who denied Jesus Christ three times? He denied Jesus Christ three times after he vehemently claimed that he would be willing to die for Jesus. He would never turn against him. And after he denied Jesus the third time, the rooster crowed, and Jesus and Peter had eye contact. Ooh, what a crushing blow. What a crushing blow. And so when, <clears throat> excuse me, when Jesus died, Peter must be thinking, oh, last words I ever said to my, to, to my master and my teacher were, I don't even know him. He never had a chance to to come back, never had a chance to reply, now Jesus is dead. I, I'm not sure that Peter is anxious or hoping that, oh, I wish I could see Jesus again. I'm sure he's ruining the fact that his last words I were, I don't know him. So the fact that Peter was one of the first ones that Jesus appeared to actually holds a lot of weight because Peter would be absolutely shocked. Like, really? You're back? I think he had some things he wanted to say. But it's interesting to note that the scriptures say that Jesus appeared to Peter. In other words, it's a lot different than saying, and Peter happened to see Jesus. Because the fact that Jesus appeared to Peter shows that it was intentional. He did it on purpose. It wasn't an accidental thing that it happened in passing. That Jesus intentionally appeared to Peter so that he could show that his Savior, Peter's Savior, is alive today. In addition to Peter, there was over 500 different people who saw him. Different groups of people. Jesus appeared to different groups. Again, this is good evidence also because uh, some say that the resurrection of Jesus is perpetrated because of uh, hallucinations. People had these hallucinations and thought that they saw Jesus. I mean, it's, you know, it's not uncommon. Some people have hallucinations and think that they are seeing an aberration of somebody who's coming and, 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 and so forth. But it's very difficult to induce group hallucination. So when Jesus is appearing to different groups like this, and uh, apparently, we, we don't know this for sure, but the Bible seems to say that there's more appearances that happen that are not necessarily recorded in the Scriptures. But these are recorded in the scriptures so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God. Not only did he appear to these 500 different, uh, 500 people, the 500 witnesses is pretty good. But um, he also appeared to Paul. And Paul says, he finally and lastly appeared to me, one who is born at an untimely time. That word, that word untimely has to do, what is similar, I mean in Greek it's similar to the word abort. And so one that who was born at an odd time, at the wrong time. Peter, or Paul is an incredible witness. If you remember the story of Paul, his first name was Saul. He was an ardent and um, 
zealous Jew who despised the Christian sect and those who were following after this Jesus character. In his eyes, this guy as Jesus was the worst thing that ever happened to the Jews and the Jewish religion. And he was ardent and he was fervent in his desire to destroy this Christian sect. And as you re begin to read in the, verse, in the book of Acts, you see that he went from house to house. He arrested some. Some were beaten. Some were also murdered and lost their life. And Paul admits to killing several of these followers of the way. And then, on his way to Damascus, Jesus, the risen Savior, appears to him. And that was a life-changing experience. That's what conversion means. If you have any question about what being converted as a Christian means, you should read the story of Paul. Here's a guy who was walking one direction, turned completely around the other direction, completely converted, where he spent the rest of his life ardently, zealously proclaiming a risen Savior. And then we're told that as Paul is writing this passage in Corinthians, there were many witnesses, eyewitnesses, still living, whom Paul had this chance to talk with. Now, we, we might, there might be some discussion as to whether or not Jesus is real. Some say that the question of Jesus' reality, of, of, uh, that he's real, has to do that there's not that much in history outside of the scriptures written about him. However, there is as much written about Jesus as there is about uh, Alexander the Great. Anybody have any questions about uh, Alexander the Great being a real figure in history? Not usually. So the fact is that Jesus has as much information about him, but we have this question. Um, my point is, is that very few people in their right mind would question whether or not Paul was a real person. Paul is clearly a real person who wrote these books. He's the greatest theologian of the New Testament. He's the greatest Christian apologist. Nobody questions whether or not Paul is a real person. So Paul is either an incredibly, he's, he's either a flaming idiot and totally hallucinating, or he's telling us something of truth and fact. And the reason he writes this chapter in 1 Corinthians, the resurrection chapter, is because there was this there was this difficulty going on in the Corinthian church and he wanted to bring it home that the resurrection is absolutely crucial to our faith. Now, I want to reiterate that fact to us today that the crucifixion is absolutely critical because if there is no resurrection, death wins. Death wins. That's the end, folks. You might as well just check out right now. There's nowhere else. Right? I mean, what else, what, what else is there to hope for? There is no hope. Death wins. And so, so take your life now or take your life later, but just take your life because what's the point? There's nothing after this, and this, there, there's, we're not going anywhere. If there's no resurrection, death wins. It's done. If there is a resurrection, then death is destroyed. Jesus destroyed it death and sin. The resurrection also vindicates Jesus. He was accused and found guilty and killed on a cross. Rising again from the grave vindicates him, shows his innocence. Next, the thing we see is this, the, the, Paul makes his correlation between sin and death and the resurrection. If Jesus has been raised, the power of death is broken. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. There's no way to take care of this sin issue. Sin, if there's no resurrection there's, and death has not been defeated, because of that, then sin rests upon us. And the problem with our world today is trying to find a way to get underneath, to get away, to get rid of the burden of guilt and sin. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why Jesus suffered death, because death is the result of sin. And that's why Jesus rose again from the grave in the resurrection, because he shows that he alone has conquered sin and death in the resurrection. Let's look at this next passage in Romans. <clears throat> death is the result of sin as humans turn away from a life-giving God. In, passage, in, in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, 
Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Death reigned and reigns today except for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important. If we can just jump right to the last slide, please. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11 reads this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's the point. We, we just had an incredible demonstration of that verse right there. We just had a, 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 a graphic illustration of what it means, our salvation, this thing of baptism. This verse here is the one that we had posted after each one of those videos. Because you can put your name in there. David Homer died and was buried with Christ by baptism into death, that like as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so David Homer also should walk in newness of life. That's my testimony. It's very clear that it's a matter of faith. We take that step of faith. But you know, the amazing thing is this. The amazing thing is that Jesus has given us a way to enact in public and in a physical way exactly what my salvation means. That's why we have baptism. That's why this baptism is by immersion. Because that's the picture, folks, that is, is a picture of my salvation. I died on the cross with Jesus. I was in him. I was in Christ in the grave, and I am in Christ in the resurrection again. And I know there's other traditions. I know there's other traditions that include sprinkling and, 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 and pouring and so forth, but those traditions have gutted the, the picture that Jesus Christ has given to us in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And, and you saw today five people who took a public stand and said, I am standing identified with Jesus, with his death, his burial, and his resurrection again. It's, it's powerful. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. And that's why I get pumped every time somebody steps out and says, I want to make that identification with Jesus Christ. I want to make it clear. And uh, with all due respect to traditions, I think that traditions have, have taken away that message that Jesus wants us to make clear in, how, in our identification with him. We today are going to celebrate in this, in this communion. This is also a very poignant uh, demonstration. Uh, you'll notice that uh, baptism, uh, it comes as, a, as an outward demonstration of our salvation. And now this is something that we do regularly to be reminded of, the, of what Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross. This speaks of the, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from unrighteousness and his broken body. Now, actually, we should do this first and then have the baptism because it's the cross that comes first and then the burial and then the resurrection. 
we're doing it this way because we wanted our new baptismal candidates to come and to join us together as the body of Christ as we celebrate together in a communion, in a fellowship, as we join together around, uh, around this communion table. So um, where are our baptism candidates? Can, can, I, can I ask to trade with them? And uh, the Roloff family is right here. You're fine. Lucas is here. Uh, Raymond and Monica, if you'll just come right up here, please. And I'll uh, ask our ushers if you'll come forward and, and prepare us then for this um, uh, communion time. But before we do this, the cross is representative of what Jesus Christ did to take away our sin, his broken body and his shed blood. The Bible reminds us that we need to take this carefully. It should never be a glib, uh, uh, never be a glib ceremony. We just say, hey, well, let's just do it because we do it every month. It's a serious reminder that our sins are very costly and our sins lead to death. And Jesus is the, re is the resurrection. So let's don't come to this celebration then bringing sin with us and bringing known uh, uh, um, guilt in our heart for things we've done because th that, would be, that would be taking this wrong. So let's just take a moment of quietness, a moment of silence, and... Uh, Ask God's Holy Spirit to show us if there's something in our life, maybe something wrong with another person, something we have between us, between another person, something in our life, and let's just confess it to him. We don't have to ask forgiveness. You don't ever need to ask. He says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And because of this cross, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So let's just pause for a moment.